I will then I see a few more people just joined us. Sure. Um, as you may uh, notice, we are set up is a webinar this morning. This means you're going to be able to see and hear Regina throughout the presentation. Um, she is going to be doing a combination of PowerPoint and some um, live demonstration for you. She's going to show you how to utilize your take and make kit, which you have probably already picked up and you're anxious to get started. Um, it's a great time and day to start some seeds. So we're happy to have you. We, I still see a few people coming in. So we'll give them a few minutes and we'll get started shortly. Sorry, I was muted. I do see a question in the chat. So the take and make bags I'm referring to um, upon registration, um, you would have got notification to come pick them up. Um, I don't know if you did not register in our, um, in our library catalog, but if you registered, unless you registered like yesterday, um, you should have got a call to come pick up your take and make bag. Fortunately, I do have a few more. So if you did not pick them up or you just didn't get that notification because you registered yesterday, then yes, these bags are available. Unfortunately, um, uh, this is going to be recorded. So you can certainly take notes throughout the program and then pick this up later today or even Monday or Tuesday. So if you didn't get your bags yet, then no worry. You can do that. You can listen to it. And uh, Regina is allowing us to record it. It'll be on our YouTube station. So you could rewatch if you need to for any reason. But um, absolutely, I have extra bags. And if you registered yesterday, that's why you didn't get a call to come pick it up. I hope that answers your question. Okay. All right, it is now six after. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I see we do have a, a lot of people in here, so that's great. Um, so Linda, thank you for your enthusiasm. I'm also super excited. I did not plant eggplants last year or the jalapenos, so I'm excited to add those to my garden. So I'm looking forward to get some advice from Regina before doing so, um, because uh, those are new crops for myself and I'm sure a lot of us here. So Regina, yeah. um, welcome, good morning, and feel free to get started. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, first, I would like to thank Amber and the Middle Country Public Library for um, inviting me to give this presentation. I am a very uh, long-term girl. I've been growing since I was eight years old. Uh, probably not uh, an expert at eight, obviously, but over the years, we all learn things and I continue to learn and I learn from people. And so I'm happy that people are here to learn from me today, whatever I can share. Um, I actually own a seed sower farm. I'm a small market garden operation. Mainly I, I grow organic transplants and sell them at farmer's markets and out of my driveway. But in addition, and what I really love doing is the education part of my, my business. And that is to teach people how to grow their own food. I can't imagine a, a more um, worthy endeavor. And I think uh, last year with the situation uh, with the COVID and the pandemic, I think a lot of people are starting to understand how important it is to have access to your own food. This program, Grow Your Own, um, is actually one of uh, many that I teach. This one is in, in particular considering um, we're talking about these three types of vegetables today, the peppers, eggplants, and tomatoes. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm seeing transplants in the store already, and why am I um, starting them just now? 
there's a couple of reasons why. We're starting them now uh, because this is a, uh, the, the best way for somebody who doesn't have a lot of infrastructure, such as lighting and a warm place to keep your plants, to start them very early. This is a great time to start things so you can really get them outdoors as soon as they sprout. But um, before I get any further, um, I know uh, Amber said that she'll be monitoring questions in the chat box. Um, I will do my best to answer any questions that may not apply to whatever I'm saying at the end. Um, but feel free to throw some questions in there. Okay, so today we're starting with uh, growing your own. And uh, on the image, this image in the center here is a, uh, a basket of, of Cipollini onions I grew a number of years ago. I'm a big onion fan. I, I endeavor to be the allium queen of Long Island. That is my goal in life. Um, and this is a variety that you wouldn't be able to get unless you started your own seeds. And these, you start very early in the season. So we're not talking about onions today, but I just want to give you an idea of the variety that's available to you when you're not stuck with just buying transplants from a big box store. Or even a local nursery, they don't carry everything. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of varieties that you might want to try. Oh, okay, sorry. So I have to hit this first. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about the why, how, what, where, and when to grow your own. And um, let me get myself out of here. So uh, why do you want to grow your own? First, really variety. The, the, like I just said, the, the, there are myriad of varieties out there of every possible type of plant you'd like to grow. Many of which are we are losing through uh, the fact that people are not growing them. So one of the things also is when you grow your own, you have more control over what you're growing, uh, what aspects of that plant are appealing to you. Perhaps it's, a, it's an heirloom variety that's kind of losing uh, uh, availability out there. You could be, you can be contributing to keeping that, that variety alive and growing year after year. It's almost instant gratification. There's really nothing like starting some seeds yourself uh, and seeing that little uh, sprout just to pop up through the, uh, the soil is just really, it's really miraculous. I mean, you look at this dry little seed and you think nothing's gonna happen and you put it in the soil, you give it a little water, you give it some TLC, of course. And uh, lo and behold, seven days later, six, four, five, six days later, you might see a little sprout and it's really exciting. If you're doing this earlier in the season, you can get a jump start in the season for many things that can go out now. So those would be things like lettuce or cabbage or broccoli, um, things that like cooler weather. These particular varieties we're teaching about today are warm weather plants. So they're not gonna really be too happy to go out right now as a plant, but they will be in a few more weeks, which is when you'll be able to get them out into the ground, hopefully. You can save money. If you went gone to the, um, any of the stores lately, uh, seedlings can cost some money. And you know sometimes you're stuck with a four pack of one variety. Uh, so you're buying four of one that you're not necessarily thrilled with, or maybe you're thrilled with one of those four, but you want three other different types. Uh, this is a really inexpensive way to buy a lot of different types of varieties um, and to save a lot of money. Seeds cost about four, I think, um, depending on where you get them, they can cost anywhere from $2 to like four or $5 a packet. In that packet, there's many seeds in them, uh, at least 10, 20 seeds of any particular variety. And if you're only growing a few plants, many of those seeds you can hold on till next year to grow. So you don't have to plant the whole packet, but you get nice variety. And of course you get what you got want. This is where I tell the, the tale of a friend of mine who one year thought she was buying 20 beefsteak tomato plants and one uh, cherry tomato plant. And what she found out as the season progressed was she had 20 cherry tomato plants. And if anyone's ever grown cherry tomato plants, you know, it's an, it's a, it's a, an arduous uh, task to pick them all the time because you have to keep the plant producing. The only way the plant's going to keep producing is if you keep picking its fruit. Um, and so she was spending her whole life just picking, washing, bagging, and giving away cherry tomatoes. And uh, when you go to those big box stores, people are a little careless sometimes with the tags. They may move a tag around and you may not be getting what you really want. So that's my cautionary tale. That's one final uh, reason you should really grow your own. Oops, what's going on here? Okay, so the how. So what you really need is some kind of a potting mix and pots. You can also use these peat pellets. Today, we got these peat pellets 
through your package, right? Um, I want to make sure I have this holding up. This is that peak pellet um, that you add water to that was part of that take and make package that Amber put together so thoughtfully. Um, this is uh, really easy to store. doesn't take a lot of room, uh, not messy at all. And you can just add water to this and it becomes a little soil capsule, right? So it's going to hold the seed and it's going to give it the nutrition it needs to get started to start growing. Um, you could also pre-germinate and that's a whole nother bag, but um, basically you take tomato seeds, pepper seeds, eggplants, in this case, it's like cucumber seeds, and you just put them on a moist paper towel in a little moist condition, keep them moist for a few days in a little warm spot, not too warm, but not cold, and they'll start to germinate. And you can see this is the beginning of germinations in this, in this um, image on the bottom right. Those are the rootlets that are coming out. So a plant will always start its root first because it's got to access nutrients from the soil and then it'll put up its shoot. So this is a great way to test your seeds. Um, but basically, um, that's one of the techniques you can use. But in today's, we're going to just be going right into these seeds because uh, these pea pellets, because it would be impossible really to get a, 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 a little shoot, like a little um, pre-germinated seed into here without kind of messing it up. If you were using soil, it'd be a different story. Okay. And then there's, you know, today we're, trans, we're going to start transplants indoors. These particular varieties, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, are warm weather plants. They do not like to be put out too soon, but they also need a longer germination, a longer time to maturity. Uh, and maturity is not picking that tomato, pepper, or eggplant. Maturity is actually the point where the plant can actually start sexual reproduction. And that would be making a flower having you know the ovary ready and the uh the um stamen so that the, the pollen gets into the ovary and makes your fruit so the flower is the sign of maturity but it's not the point at which you pick something so sometimes you'll see um on a seed packet you might see something that says uh 70 to 90 days from transplant to maturity or it might say to harvest now to harvest would be actually picking that plant so that's just something to pay attention to um, when you're when you're starting seeds to know about when they'll um, germinate and I mean when they'll actually be ready to harvest or come to maturity. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the what most important in anything in life and as important in growing anything, whether it's a uh, a plant or uh, anything that you're trying to make turn out well, you need to give it time. You need to give it the attention and the intention. Your intention of how you treat your plants is going to make or break how good a gardener you are. This is not a set and forget kind of endeavor gardening. Gardening is a constant attention to what the plant needs when it needs your cultivating. You're actually working with that plant to give it the best conditions it could possibly have. So that is number one. If you think you're going to plant something and walk away from it and come back to it um, weeks later and think it's going to hand you what you want, it's not like that. This is, uh, it's not Star Trek <laughs> where we can just choose to have something uh, conjured up. It doesn't work that way. And, but what this also means is you are spending some time out in nature and you're understanding a little bit more about your environment and how that affects your plants. And you ultimately, and it's a very, very relaxing and there's a lot of benefits to gardening. So this is not only for you, we could even throw in their TLC, a little TLC for you and a little TLC for the plants. Of course you need seeds. Uh, you're going to need a lot water. You're gonna have, need a source of water. If you're growing in your backyard and you have a, a gardening hose that you can use to water or an irrigation system, that's great. A watering can works just as well if you're dealing in, in an apartment situation and maybe you have pots. You're just going to need to be sure that you're watering. And if you are using things like containers or raised beds, just be aware, raised beds really need to be watered a lot more. They need a lot more um, irrigation set to towards them um, than an in-ground plant. An in-ground plant can reach down into the soil and really pull moisture out where you think it doesn't even exist. But a container is containing it, which means it's not going to have the opportunity to shoot its roots down that low into the, into the soil surface. So water is really important and raised beds and containers will need a little bit more water, but not a lot of water. Generally speaking, we talk about water, uh, people have water sprinklers going on every day for 20 minutes. 
that's not my suggestion to you on any of the plants you're growing, whether you're growing turf or you're growing uh, vegetables or flowers. It's better to water several times a week deeply if you need it. Um, I always work with nature. I look at the weather. If it's going to be pouring rain tomorrow, I am not watering today. You know, if things look a little struggly, I might throw a little water on them, but I try to really work with nature. And I really don't water more than once or twice a week if, it's, if we have a good raining season. Light. You're going to need some light if you're going to start things indoors earlier in the season. And I'm going to talk about that for those of you who want to try this next year and start like in March. Um, um, and I'm going to actually show you some examples right now. So you can use uh, a comp, you can see here in this image, I have um, a shop light over my plants there. This mass mismatch of plants, something probably started very early in the season. Um, so that shop light has a fluorescent bulb, has two fluorescent bulbs in it. One's a warm white shop light bulb, fluorescent. The other one is a cool white. Now technology has moved on. There are many, many, many more options out there. This is just something I've been doing for the last 20 years. So I stick with it. If it's working for me, I don't really change things. Although I will say I got an LED light this year and it is the bomb. I love it. I love it. But LEDs, be careful if you're going to go out and spend a lot of money on an LED like I did. The one I have to get does have a nice long life. But these things actually have a lifespan LEDs. They don't last forever. A fluorescent light bulb, you can just buy a new bulb and throw it in. These LEDs, they're all one compact uh, strip. They're one solid state piece of material, you're not gonna be able to take that bulb out and replace it in every case. So consider that if you're thinking about really upgrading. Um, so here's a compact fluorescent light. This is, I got this thing at Ikea a bunch of years ago. I have in here the fluorescent light bulb that we've all hopefully switched to. They're really cheap. Uh, they use less electricity. It actually happens to have just about the right um, uh, light spectrum that a plant needs. Um, you can also get a plant grow light and stick that in a fluorescent light fixture. Um, you, maybe you have one of these around. Um, this happens to be a reject um, of my mother's. She got this for Christmas. It's an arrow garden. It's fabulous. I'm not a hydroponic grower. I be, I'm a believer in soil. I believe in soil life. Um, but this thing works great as a, as a, uh, I hacked it up so I can put a plant under it and, and just grow something like this right underneath it, right? It's going to work like a charm. So if you got one of these lying around, you can, you can, you can hack it so that it's not necessarily a um, fluorescent, it's not necessarily a hydroponic situation, but it's just, it's, it's a good alternative to going out and buying a new light bulb. And that works really well. I can actually put an entire flat under there as long as I have support and the light source because it raises up so high, really gives me good coverage. Okay, and, and position is important. So six inches above whatever starts to grow, if you're growing early in the season, is really important. Uh, the plant needs the light. You know, if you've ever grown uh, transplants on a windowsill, you'll notice they get very stretched out. They get very leggy, they call that. And that's because the the light source that you think you're getting great light through your window, you're not. We have all of these coatings now on light on windows that kind of keep the house cooler in the summer. Um, and they do filter out some of the UV light that the plant needs to grow. So you need to keep these lights, if you're going to start earlier in the season, like in March, you need to keep them about six inches above your plant at, at all times. So you're going to have to have some adjustment that you need to do. But like I said today, because we're starting now at this time of year, um, we're not going to need to do that. We're going to get them to germinate by keeping them in a fairly warm area, these plant, these seedlings. Once they do that, you can put them outside to a sheltered spot. Okay, so the what? We already talked about this. You need a growing medium. Um, you need um, amendments maybe. So if you're going to, once you get your plant started and growing, you're going to want to put something out there to help the plant grow if, if your soil doesn't have tons of nutrition. Maybe some of you are starting a brand new garden this year. The soil should be pretty, pretty uh, well uh, stocked with different um, nutrients, but it doesn't ever hurt to add some slow release fertilizers like worm castings, which i.e. is worm poop. Yes, they take these little worms and they harvest their poop and they put it in bags. And it's one of the best amendments you can put in your soil. 
Kelp is a food, is actually a seaweed that they dry down and they make it into a granule thing. That's also a great uh, feedstock for your plants. And they're slow release and natural. They're not synthetic uh, fertilizers, which means they're not going to go wash into the soil if your plant doesn't use them. They hang around a long time. They bond to uh, organic matter in the soil. And that's a whole nother class. And we're gonna actually have a, um, I think on the 28th of June is going to be a, a beginner gardener class. And we're gonna talk about all these very basic things there. Um, you're gonna need a container with a lid or some kind of uh, way to keep the moisture um, in there. Cause the plant is gonna, the, the, the soil, you wanna keep that soil more, it's not super, super wet. And I think I might have soaked mine a little too much earlier, but we'll figure it out. Um, but something like this is perfect. This might look familiar. I'm a great upcycler. My husband probably wants to shoot me, but I don't throw any of these things away because these were great for like holding any kind of things like this. You're gonna wanna, you know, put your water in there, a container. You can, if you had some kind of a plastic cover you could put over there, that would be great. Like takeout containers are phenomenal for that if you get Chinese food um, or even just a plastic bag, right? So this is a grocery bag from the grocery store. I'm just gonna put that over the top and, and nod it and it's gonna create a little greenhouse. Bottom heat is preferred but not required. So bottom heat, what is that? Well, I went out a number of years ago and I bought these great heat mats. They keep the plant soil warm, which is great. The plants are, these plants in particular are, are really designed or uh, they've evolved to be in warm climates. They're, they're, they're not uh, native to North America, they're all new, new world plants. So they're like, they're used to having warmer temperatures, warmer soils, probably through the year. Peppers, in fact, in, um, I wanna say Central America, even South America are perennial. They never die. They, they're like a plant that never dies. Whereas here they die because it gets too cold. Um, so if you don't have a seed mat, that's absolutely fine. You'll see here in this image, I have been utilizing, uh, the one thing I learned at my greenhouse class from Farmingdale is, um, this thing called radiant heat. So I have this, this burner. This is my oil burner on the right-hand side. You can see underneath that all of those trays, I have uh, stacked them up. Um, the heat that comes off of that is sufficient uh, for that bottom tray. And now that bottom tray is gonna radiate the heat up through those top trays. So all I do is use this now. I never use those seat mats. I, I'm never planning to use them again. They use a lot of electricity. And if I can make it work with just the heating element in my house at this time of year to get things going, that's what I do. So this is a great way to go. Top of a refrigerator, if you have room at the top of your refrigerator, that's a great way to go. Um, any place where there's a little bit of warmth will just give those plants, especially the peppers, a little bit extra opportunity to germinate. You're gonna need labels. So um, today, I, I mean, you can use anything for a label. I mean, you could take your seed packet right? And you could just clip it to your container with a, to, with a clothespin if you want to until you're ready to get them in the ground. Um, I happen to have some plant labels around. I've already labeled it. I'm going to label on this when, I, when I'm starting what that plant is because they all look the same. And it, oh my gosh, have you ever have had the situation where you've tri tripped and all your seedlings fell out? And you're like, oh my Lord, I have no idea what's what. Because you can't tell what the variety is. If you grow more than one tomato, they all look the same. But when they first come up, they're gonna all look the same. But so I have a, a little tag here for this Italian tomato today that we're gonna to grow. It's going to be uh, 70 days to maturity. I don't think it says that on the packet, but it, I think it says it on the slides further on. I'm growing it, I put today's date on it, even though I'm not putting it in the ground yet, I kind of have a sense of when I started it. I should look for some, some kind of activity in the next five to seven days on this. And um, that's pretty much it. So that's your label. Um, and a pen, something that doesn't fade. So we have Sharpies, these work great. There's a particular one that works even better than this. It's the industrial one. They're kind of expensive and they're like gold. I, I try not to lose them. I do lose them all the time though. But a Sharpie would be great. A pencil on a piece of uh, this on a plastic marker would be great. Um, let's see, what else do I have? I mean, I'm pretty, like I said, I'm pretty uh, creative on my labeling. I don't think I have anything here. I must have misplaced that one thing I did have. You know, you, if you go out to dinner and they give you a plastic fork or a knife, you can use that. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money. All of these things are very inexpensive. You can get a, you can get crazy and do what you want, or you can be very, very frugal. And then you need to write down what it is that you started and when. 
because um, it's not going to do you any good if you don't know when you started something. Um, or if you've put it in a garden spot and you don't know what it is, and maybe it's particularly if you want to save the seeds from that particular variety, you'll want to make sure you make it, write it down somewhere. Okay, the where. So look, we talked about this already. You can start indoors now. These things we're starting indoors today aren't going to need any light. You're going to, you're going to just, as soon as they germinate, you're going to get them outside to a sheltered spot. You could start right at, out in the ground. And, and many of you, if you've ever grown tomatoes, you probably find tomato plants in your garden in about another few weeks. You'll be like, oh, I don't have to start anything. I, but the problem with that is you don't know what you're getting. Um, if you have particular love for a particular variety, you're not gonna know what type of tomato you get unless you only grow one variety. And then you can be pretty sure that's gonna be the variety and nature does the work for you. This is especially true of things like um, lettuce. If you let your lettuce go to seed, and that means it sends up a flower and it gets all puffy, like a like almost looks like a, um, like a, Dandelion flower, but it's much smaller. It's kind of got that light, airy thing going on. If those seeds blow and land in your garden next spring, you'll have lettuce seedlings all ready to go. And all you need to do is now move them to where you want them. I just did that yesterday. It was great. I love doing that. Um, whichever you decide to do, indoors or outdoors, on those things that you can start outdoors, these three things you definitely have to start indoors. They need to go in as a transplant if you want to get any kind of a of harvest, um, consult your packet. The packet gives you all the information. And I don't think this packet is telling you exactly how far to plant things, but I can tell you that. There are planting guides out there. There are many planting guides out there. And um, if you, I'm not going to open this link up, but there's a planting calendar um, that um, a woman called Margaret Roach has that she puts it up every year on her, her website. Her website's called A Way to Garden. She's a terrific writer. She used to work for Martha Stewart and she wound up walking away from all of that crazy lifestyle and bought a house up in Copic, New York and has a, um, a beautiful garden that she opens up twice a year on open garden days. And she's really, really got a wonderful sense of humor and she's, a, she's really um, a terrific writer and full of information. She interviews all kinds of experts. So I highly recommend you go to awaytogarden.com. You can see the seed ca calculator there. All you have to do is put in your last frost date which in our case is April 17th, which I always, I kind of don't believe. I think it's more like May, May 1st, maybe May 15th. And certainly you don't want to plant too early or else you're going to have heartache. But you can go there too. But there are planting guides abounding. I, uh, um, if anybody's interested in one, I can certainly share one with, with Amber. I think I might have sham, sh shared a few already with her. She can forward those on to you or have them available at the library. So when, so like I just said, we are apparently in zone seven here on Long Island. We are, um, we have a last frost date of April 15th. Now, April 15th is just a week away, right? Not even, it's like five days away. And you can see April can be kind of variable. I would really not go with that date. I would go closer to May 1st. Mother's Day is your traditional time to plant things like this, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers. Clearly, you're not going to plant your little sprout in the ground on April 15th. So April 15th, a little too soon. But, you know, every year it's different. You can take a risk if you want. And October 15th is the first frost date. So why am I mentioning that? Well, many of the things that you can grow in the ground now, those seedlings that I was talking about before, like uh, cabbage, peas. Peas should be going in now. If you haven't gotten your peas in, you should get those in the ground, right into the ground. Um, those are things you can start again in the, in the late summer for harvesting in the fall. So it's almost like the mirror image of the spring, except you have to take a couple of uh, things into consideration that um, things like you transplanting anything now, we set that by two weeks because the roots have now got to redevelop into the soil. They have to acclimate themselves. Like everybody needs a little time to acclimate. Plants are no different. And then um, as far as fall plantings, you're going to add a couple of weeks onto any maturity date or harvest date you're going to back off two extra weeks and plant them two weeks earlier than that frost date, that last frost date. That's a whole nother conversation. We do offer that program occasionally at this library. It's called um, late bloomers, or sometimes I call it, um, yeah, I think I call it late bloomers, what to start now for a full harvest. But anyway, um, so what I would say is um, just bear that in mind. If you, if you missed your opportunity to grow something for the spring, you can try again in the fall. But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about these peppers and eggplants. So 
Next thing we're going to talk about are the, what we're going to grow today. So today we have the Italian heirloom tomato. Uh, we, seed saver, these are all seedling, seeds that come from Seed Savers Exchange. That is a great organization that, that Amber has been really supporting by buying only the seeds that she has. All of her seeds come from Seed Savers Exchange, I believe. And they're great because what they basically do is they save these heirloom and hard to find varieties and they, they keep them perpetuating through the years by people growing them. Um, it's not a lot to become a member. Um, I'm a member, but you can really get some great information just from the website itself. They talk about seed saving, all of that stuff. So today the Italian heirloom tomato was apparently Seed Savers Exchange's 2020 12 winner of their tomato tasting. And I can't imagine how many tomatoes they have to taste. Um, these grow very large, these fruits, they grow to over a pound. Now a pound fruit is like, I don't know if you've gone to the farmer's market and you try to buy a couple of tomatoes at an organic stand. And like they tell you it's $15 just to go get two pounds of tomatoes and you're going to have a heart attack. That's a pretty big piece of fruit. So bear that in mind when you're growing this, that, that give it the space it needs. Um, you can read the rest of it. It's 78 days from transplant. So let's just, just for argument's sake, let's say we get this tomato in the ground. Let's say we start it today. Germinates in about a week. Let's say a week. So that's the 17th. So if you planted this mid-May, four to six weeks from now, I would say like the end of May. And don't get panicky. You know, people think they have to have everything in the ground by uh, Mother's Day. Not, not at all. My gosh, I plant tomatoes in July and I still get a harvest off of that. So the truth is you want to make sure that the plant has the right conditions. And if it does, it's going to give you a, a crop at some point, unless something terribly wrong goes bad, goes something bad goes wrong, like late blight or something. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to think positive thoughts for this summer. So let's just argue that you get it in the ground. Say June 1st, just my math skills. You should be getting a harvest on that sometime in August, probably the end of August, because this is a longer day variety. There are some tomatoes out there that will give you a harvest in 57 days, like a cherry tomato. So bear that in mind. This is just happens to be this particular variety. The jalapeno pepper we're growing today is called Traveler Strain. Um, if you look at your packet, there's a nice little story why they call it that. I just looked at that today and I was really interested. I love that when people get creative on how they name things. I have tomatoes that I don't even know what they are and I make my own names up. I mean, I don't sell those. I keep those for myself. But um, so these grow um, in 70, 90 days from transplant. I'm not sure if that means harvest. I'm going to say harvest 90 days. Easy. So that's three months. So you're going to look at probably September before you get a jalapeno off of this. But that's okay because peppers and eggplant tend to do better in cooler weather. They don't do fabulous in cool, cooler weather, but you'll definitely get something off of this. And then finally, the diamond egg, egg. Oh, and just one more thing about the peppers. So in this image, you'll see those green and red peppers. This happens to be a, um, an heirloom or a, an open pollinated variety, which means you can save the seed from it and be pretty sure that you're going to be able to get the same plant next year if you save those seeds and you planted them again. So um, in the case of tomatoes and eggplants, the seeds will hold these seeds if you don't plant them all today, because I know there are a number of seeds in there, um, they'll hold for a good four or five years. Peppers are a little different. They only really hold for two years. So it would be great if you wanted to save these seeds is to plant all of your jalapenos and let them get to maturity. And what maturity means for peppers, believe it or not, is the red, yellow, or orange color they're supposed to go to at maturity. So maturity means two things. It means picking that thing, but also a mature plant that you're saving seeds from has to have its full mature, maturity in, in terms of development in and of itself. So, so you've got the plant that has maturity, that gives you a fruit, and then you have the fruit that has to have to maturity. So in this picture, you'll see there's a red pepper. That's the harvest point if you're going to save the seeds. You're going to let everything go red. And if you've ever noticed why red peppers are more expensive than green peppers in the grocery store, th there's your answer. The reason is when you're getting a green pepper, it's an immature pepper. Um, it's edible. It's delicious. It's got a different flavor profile than a red pepper. But what happens is if you keep picking those peppers and the same thing with the tomatoes and the eggplants, you keep picking those fruits, the plant is, is, is still trying to put its seed out for the future. 
So here's a little secret. Plants aren't here to give us tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants or any other plant. They're out there to put their seed into the community, out into the world for next year. So you'll see those seedlings from tomatoes that you planted last year that maybe fell to the ground. That's exactly what the plant's doing. So with the case with peppers, you need to definitely make sure they go red before you save the seeds from them. Um, and they, because you're letting them go red, the plant is gonna stop producing. So when the plant keeps producing because you keep picking, what's gonna happen is it's, it's fighting to get its seed out there. Hopefully this human doesn't pick me, this next baby that I put out. But if it, does, if it doesn't, if you get it to the point where it's red, the plant will stop producing seed flowers because now it's getting its, it's all, putting all of its energy into maturing that fruit, okay? So there you go. Peppers, you need to absolutely pick red if you're going to save the seeds from them. And that's why peppers are more expensive, red peppers. The eggplant is a, um, looks like it's a cross between an Italian and an Asian to me. It's, it's a really, it's a nice, uh, smallish kind of um, pepper. It's about nine inches long. And it's going to be 70 days from transplant, I'm going to say, to maturity. Yeah, so you'll probably pick this pepper again sometime in August. I mean, this uh, plant sometime in August. Now, to know when things are fully ripe, tomatoes, you'll know. They're going to be red or yellow or whatever color they're supposed to be at maturity. Eggplants are always mature when they're shiny. If they start to get dull, they over, they've gone too far. And if they're dull in the beginning, they're too immature. So they're either too mature or over mature if they're not shiny. So just know, just because an eggplant doesn't get to this exact size, if, it, if you want to eat it and it's shiny, it's ready to go. You can eat it. Okay, so today we're going to do the uh, hands-on portion here. Today we're going to um, get your peat pot um, in place. So to start with. So this is what it looked like before. I added the water, just a little disc, right? And now I, I added water to these and this is what it looks like with the water in there. So I use a little warm water, um, probably about maybe a half a cup for these four in this container, okay? And they've all grown up nicely. Um, what we're going to do, and I'm going to do this live with you, I'm just going to go through it first here, is you're going to put, basically, um, you're going to pull away this little bit of a membrane that's on the top. This is like that netting. And that netting is going to kind of keep that peak together. So you don't want to take it off all together. You're going to make a little indention in the center. And I'm going to do that as best as I can with the, with the camera that I have on my computer. Um, and then I'm going to drop my seat in there. And then I'm going to cover it up. Um, if you were doing this earlier in the season, or if you're going to really baby these things along indoors until you get them outside, you're going to have to do something called hardening off. Hardening off is simply the case where you're taking a plant that's been living the life, you know, it's like spa treatment. Oh, I have great light and beautiful air and constant water. Um, and you're taking it, you're kind of going to kick it out to the curb and let it learn about the real lessons of life. But you don't do that all in one shot. You have to like acclimate the plant to the outdoor area because what happens outdoors and what happens indoors are totally different. Outdoors, you have wind, which is going to desiccate the leaves, which means the plant is going to need more water and it's going to have to really establish a good root system uh, to do that in time. But you really have to toughen those leaves up so they don't, they don't, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Oh, my head, I just lost it. Um, transpire any more water out of those leaves. The sun is going to kind of beat on them a little bit. It'd be like taking a person who lived in a cave and throwing them on the beach for two hours. You don't really want to do that. You want to get them used to the light because light is actually going to stress the plants a little bit too. And then winds, wind will actually help the plant become sturdier, but it's not used to that wind, which is going to desiccate the leaves. And that's pretty much it. So you're going to harden your plants off by basically doing this. And there's, I believe Amber gave you a handout for hardening off. And if not, we can get you one. Um, you're going to take this little container of seedlings. Let's just imagine this container's seedlings in here. After they sprout, if, well, you're not going to have to really do this here at this time of year. But if you had this under lights, like I do in my basement for the last month and a half, I'm going to take this container out. Let's imagine that's what this, what's happening there. I'm going to take this container outside and I'm going to put it, it outside for like an hour. 
on maybe a cloudy day. You know, I just really don't want to overwhelm it, right? Then I'm going to bring it in. The next day, I'm going to put it out for two hours, okay? And then I'm going to bring it in. The third day, I'm going to bring it out for four hours. And then I'm going to bring it in. Fourth day, eight hours, all day. And then maybe by the sixth day, I'm going to let that thing stay out overnight because that's it. It's going to be the whole spectrum. But it's a good way to start. It's a good, the good way to start is to really kind of choose like a, not a bright, bright, bright sunny day. Or if you do put your plants in something of a sheltered spot, so they're not getting pounded with that light. So they, cause it's, it is definitely going to be different than being under a light in the basement. But that's if you're only, if you're starting these like a month ago and you're babying it along under some uh, artificial light in artificial conditions, these seedlings today if I haven't said it, I'll say it again. I just want to be sure you know, you just have to put them in. Once they germinate and you see a little shoot come up, you can start bringing them outside. We're going to have warm enough temperatures. Now, say you get them to the point where they're like little seedlings. Oh, it's a great thing. They're, you know, they're about, I should really have brought seedlings up. Oh, well, I apologize. I have bazillions of them down there too. Um, say they're about, you know, four inches tall and they're just having a great time out there. Life is good. And now we're going to get a cold snap or we're going to get a frost and frosts typically happen during a, a full moon. Um, what you're going to want to do is just bring those plants in for the night and then tomorrow put them back out again and you, and then you're going to be okay. And once we get past that really that drop dead date of frost date, which I say still is mother's day, you could just leave your plants out. And then once they get to the point where they're, sizable and they're not going to get like kind of run over by anything in the garden a critter or something you can plant them in the ground so when you plant them in the ground i highly recommend i mean it doesn't say this on the instructions i highly recommend you remove this whole netting when you're ready to go in the ground at that point the roots from the seedling that you have in here the pepper tomato or eggplant are going to have kind of um uh, they're going to have they're going to have spread through the the, the soil matter here well it's not soil it's really peat um, and what's going to happen is it'll hold that root ball together. And all you're doing by taking this off is just preventing any kind of constriction on that plant. Because you can see, you can see how this is kind of a, 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 a non-natural um, material. This is actually like a, I don't know, is it a plastic, a polymer? I don't really know. But whatever it is, it doesn't really break down in the soil. So you want to pull that off from around that little thing and then you pop it into the ground at soil level okay what do we got now okay we're going to go to questions but before we go to questions um i'm going to now show you how to plant these guys out so bear with me i'm going to stop sharing for a moment i'm going to turn my video off so i don't make you nauseous okay and I'm still here, you're still here. I'm gonna just bear with me as I kind of, um, okay. So we see me, okay, what's going on here? Okay, now, so can, everyone can see this, right? So here we go. Oh, let me grab my Okay. okay, so this is my jalapeno. Let me start with this tomato. Here's now, my Gina, hair. We do have one question. I don't know sure. if you want to wait, but it's it was about what you were talking about. Linda was asking, um, what is like what temperature is frost? Is it below 37 degrees or below that? No, frost is like around 32, but you know, the thing is you can't really be sure about frost in any real way because we have these things called microclimates on long island like for example i never get a frost up here i'm at the top of a hill i mean i'm not in like any kind of mountain range or anything but in central port where we have water surrounding us more or less i'm at the top of a hill of the area when i'm not low on a low grade area so what basically happens is frost acts like almost like water it will actually flow down a hill so because I'm at the top of a hill, I never get a frost, ever. I go right to a freeze. So nothing in my garden ever gets frost damage. My car might have frost on it, but my garden doesn't because the soil still has residual heat that it's always sending up. It's, it's that, you know, 
it's like ambient heat that comes up out of the soil because the season's still fairly warm or it's warming up from the beginning of the spring. And um, so I never get a frost. It's just, I'll just get a freeze. It'll just go to 32 and everything will die from a freeze. So frost is very subjective depending on your environment, how you're growing. If your plants are elevated up, they're most likely not going to get affected by a, a frost if they're in a raised bed than something that's in the ground. So, but frost is generally around 32 degrees. It's, it's not uh, 34, 32, something like that. And it has more to do with the moisture in the air and um, a clear night. So a clear night with a full moon right around now is going to be the perfect opportunity for a frost to happen. If it doesn't happen, I would say, uh, I think everything that you have here will be okay as long as you bring it in. If we're going to get too cold at night, you want to bring them in. Tomatoes don't really like to blow, be low, below 50 degrees. Um, it'll affect the way the fruit develops. Believe it or not, the genetics of the plant will change the way the fruit develops. It'll cause it to look not so great. It'll be edible and everything, but it'll just have this thing called cat facing where it kind of makes a seam. And I'm not sure what the mechanism is for that, but if it's going to be below 50 degrees at night, I would bring these guys in. You know, if once they sprout and you get them outside, beautiful days, excellent. Oh, it's going to be 49, 50, 40, 47 degrees. I bring that thing in and then bring it back out tomorrow. It's not that hard to do initially. And then by the time you're ready to plant them, which I'm going to say, hold off on all of these and plant them at the end of uh, May, maybe June 1st. Don't panic that it's not May, May 15th or whatever they say. Um, you'll get a crop off of this if you, if you, if you tend to the plant properly. Um, Plant them then and um, you'll be fine. Now, just a caveat, tomatoes germinate quickly, eggplants and peppers a little bit less quickly. And as far as growth rate goes, tomatoes grow fast. They're the, when I start my plants in the spring and I start things for the farmer's market, I start peppers. This year I started them, I think in February, because they have an early market. But um, I start my peppers first because they're the slowest growing. And you know, nobody's gonna spend $5 on a sad looking tiny little plant. Not that it's sad looking, but it's tiny. They want big things. And believe it or not, big is not better. In fact, this is a great opportunity for me to tell you, when you plant uh, something that's younger, it's going to do better because it has less, it's gonna have less of a shock with, as you take a bigger plant. So don't get, don't get, uh, um, um, what's the word? Don't fall in love with the big plants necessarily over a small plant because sometimes they, they don't acclimate as well to the transplant. They actually go into shock. So your eggplants and your peppers are going to be kind of small. So you may even want to wait till middle of June to plant those to get them to the size where they should be. Now, um, I don't have a picture of it and I can go back and show you, but all of these plants will start off with the same kind of leaf. They all look exactly the same, but as they develop, you'll be able to tell the difference. Um, but in any case, that's the answer. I know that was a long answer for um, frost. Okay, so let's do this. Let me get my chopstick. So what I like to do, let's see if I can do this really. It's, this is a little tough because I don't really have the right camera. Okay, so here I'm going to plant my Italian, Italian heirloom, right? I'm just going to pull. I'm going to try not to move too fast because my camera doesn't seem to be holding up. I'm just pull this off just a tiny bit just to give myself a little bit more room. I'm going to take this chopstick and I'm going to loosen that soil up, right? So I've kind of got like an indention here. Basically, every one of these plants needs to be planted about a quarter of an inch deep. Okay, so what's a quarter of an inch? Well, your thumb, this part of your thumb right here to here, my mother used to tell me, or she still tells me, is about an inch. So about a quarter of that. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say maybe to here on the chopstick. I know this is really hard to say, but just do your best, right? I'm gonna take, and you don't really wanna to touch your seeds if your hands are wet. So make sure when you're ready to go that maybe you have all of your things ready to go. In fact, I'm gonna do that right now with all of my other ones because I'm not planting everything right now on the spot. And this one I'm gonna stick in here, it's out of here. I'm gonna just open up my, my soil a little bit on all of them. Then you want to use dry hands because the last thing you want to do is touch too many seeds. If you're not going to plant them all today, you're not going to want to touch the seeds with wet fingers because that's a that's a great way for the seeds to uh, start 
to wake up and you don't really want to wake them up if you're not going to plant them. So let me just quickly dry my hands. And the same thing when you go to spray these things, you're not going to want to have your packages around. You want to move them out of the area because if you spray a package, you're going to wet the container that it's in and potentially wet the seeds. And then you're going to have seeds that won't be good for you. So these are very small seeds. You can barely see this, right? I can't really see what I'm doing. I'm going to do it this way. I can't really see what I'm doing. So you can see I have, oh, what, there's like 10 seeds in here. See them at the bottom. So I'm going to take two or three. And the reason we do that is because some seeds won't germinate, no matter what you do, no matter how good of a life you give them, they're not going to germinate. I'm going to drop them right into here, right? So I'm just dropping it in. So that's two. And then this is my third one. And now all I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to cover it over. I'm just going to, it's like, this feels like a brownie, like an uncooked brownie. I'm just going to kind of cover it over. Now this is pretty wet. Look at all this water coming out. Can you see this? I'm going to drip it. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's kind of wet. So now I am not going to, no way, no how. Now I'm only going to do one. So I have a little tag I can stick in here. So I know what I'm doing, but, um, no way am I going to water that tonight or tomorrow for that matter. It really has to be moist, not sopping wet. Because sopping wet will cause the seeds to rot, right? What's your best bet on how to know how moist something is, is we were all born with this amazing little tool. It's your finger, right? You touch the soil. If it feels moist, you don't need to water it. And this is going to be my other little, uh, I'm going to go to my soapbox about watering. Same thing with your garden. Your garden doesn't need to be watered every single day. It needs to be watered two or three times a week, very deeply and at the root. So when you plant these guys, especially the tomatoes, because they are subje sub subjected to some kind of um, funguses out there and viruses, you wanna always make sure you're watering on the, wa on the soil level. You don't wanna be spraying overhead. You wanna keep the water on the soil. That's going to help the plant by not splashing up any kind of um, soil bacteria or anything onto the leaves, which can cause a problem. It's also gonna keep the moisture where it should be in the soil, right? And the plant will have better access to it. Um, it'll be there longer for the plant to absorb. Um, when you spray too, when you, when you water too infrequent, when you water frequently, but very shallowly, the plant doesn't have to really reach down into the soil to build a system, a root system to get soil water. So it's better to water two or three times a week if you have to do it. Now, there are summers where I water twice, where I water water every single day because we haven't had rain and there's nothing like rain for your irrigation. Okay, so that was the tomato. Um, I'll do this again, just so you see. So now this is going to be the jalapeno pepper. And on this in this case, I'm just gonna, do this, right? I'm just gonna take this and I'm just gonna tag that there because I'm gonna leave it like this. Same story. So the jalapeno pepper, and if you looked at these seeds, they look pretty similar. I can tell the difference because I've worked with seeds for so long, but um, these are bigger. The pepper seeds are a little bigger, um, but again, you wanna put two or three in there. Now, what happens when all three come up? Well, that's that's like the Sophie's choice of plants. You have to decide. You can either snip one off like, like Amber says in the instructions, which is, um, this is why I'd never be a good farmer. Um, or you can kind of separate them out at some point, but no, none of those options are really ideal for me. So, but two of them in here, I'm going to cover this over very, very lightly. I'm not going to get too crazy. I'm going to push down on that so that it's got good soil to seed contact. You might think, oh, wow, she just really pushed down on that. How's that seedling gonna get up through that soil level now she's compacted it? Seeds are very strong, they're amazing. So basically you want good seed to soil contact so that the moisture of the soil and the support of that soil is right around that seed. Okay, that's that, that's the egg, that's the, that's the jalapeno. And the diamond eggplant, I'm going to do next. And this is all really easy. I'm just 
figuring I'll do it since I have them all here ready to go. So I'm an eggplant. Um, okay, wait, before, well, I'll go back to the end and I'll tell you how far to plant these things because I don't think it says it here. Um, this says that the eggplant and the pepper both say bottom heat would be helpful in getting to germinate sooner. So go with those choices I gave you, top of your refrigerator, or if you have a, um, even if you have like a radiator with a heater, Right now, this time of year, the heat's still kicking on a little until I shut it off and my husband starts to really freeze. Um, but th that burner, if you have a burner, an oil burner downstairs, that is like my best bet, always. That's my, my main production. Oh, all my production now happens that way. So the eggplant's the same thing. We're gonna just take one of these little containers, these little pea pots. This is soaking wet. I put way too much, I put way too much water in here. I don't know if you can see all the water in here. Way too much. Oh, I just almost wet, almost wet the computer. Jeez. This is live. This is live television. You never know what's going to happen. All right. So I'm going to put those in again. I've already made this little, well, I'm doing this whole package now because I've got water in my container. So I'm going to basically make that little hole. I'm going to pull this away a little bit. Just give me a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, leg room, more or less. I'm going to make that little hole. I'm going to pop that guy in and now they're wet. So they're impossible to get in, but I'll get them in. I, I actually do that pre-germinating and I usually use a tweezer to get them in. And I've got two in there. Can you see? I'm going to poke them in. I'm going to pack this down. About a quarter of an inch. If you don't go down a quarter of an inch, what's going to happen is they're going to pop up really early and they're going to get very leggy. And that, that's a great opportunity for the plants to like suffer from weakness because it, it's just not a, um, good, it's not a good situation. Okay, I'm going to put this back in. Now, let's just assume I have, uh, I know that this is my diamond eggplant. It's the only one I haven't marked. But I would normally put a marker in there that says what it is. The next thing I'm gonna do is I am gonna drain this water off first. That's number one, there's too much water in here. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to just go ahead and I can either use, oh, here's my fork. This is what I was talking about. You know, we, we have these at my restaurant. So I, I use these over for that. But um, you can either use a Ziploc bag and just stick this whole container in there and make that little greenhouse. I'm always thinking of great greenhouse uh, options. You know those bags you get? I don't know why they have to do this, but when you buy a set of sheets or a pillow or a comforter, it's always wrapped in plastic. I'm really thinking those would make great little greenhouses, but of course you'd have to vent those because it would get very hot in there. It gets very hot in here. You know, the warmth kind of accumulates in here. So you wouldn't want to leave this in a warm spot after it's grown, after it's actually sprouted, you're going to take it out of this. You just need, this is just your opportunity to get it to sprout. So that's it. That's what I would do. Or if you don't have some black bags, if you go grocery shopping and you go to the produce section, this will work just as well. Just do this. And that's it. And this will, these will germinate in about seven to 10 days. Uh, eggplants and peppers come up a little sl more slowly. So be patient. So what you might want to do is write in the calendar when you germinated them, when you started them, to see if they're um, actually going to germinate. Now, if I'm sure they will, so I'm not even going to say if they don't, because we're really at the end of the grow, end of the opportunity for you to grow these things indoors and have a, an opportunity to get them out in the ground and have them produce for you. So I think that's it. Oh, and if you have to spray. Um, this is a little bottle I got at Target. It works great. I actually got it originally for, for alcohol and water when we were at the beginning of the pandemic and I was going everywhere and spraying everything. Um, these work great. Really all you would do then is mist that on there. And that's what I would really do up until the point where the plant is really, really strong. I would say two to three um, true leaves. So the leaves, let me see if I can go back and share my screen again. I'm gonna see if I can show you what a seedling looks like. Um, so you have a general sense. Okay, let's go back. Oops. So this is like a seedling, right? These are the leaves that kind of, kind of come up. They look exactly the same on a pepper tomato and an eggplant. I'm trying to see if I have, now on this picture right here, uh, this very forward picture, this looks like a, oh, I'm not sure what that is. 
But the picture in, further in the back, you can kind of see there are more leaves here. This might be like a, this could be a collie, this could be a cabbage or something. I don't remember. But the true leaves are gonna look different from those first leaves. So what happens is the first leaves come up, those are the cotyledons. That is actually just the first chance for the plant to start doing photosynthesis. Because that root, the energy of that seed is in the seed. And then once it sends its root down, it's gonna start taking nutrients up to help the plant grow. Once it sends up a shoot, it's now using the sunlight to actually feed the root system through photosynthesis. So once that happens, the next set of leaves come up are the first true set of leaves. They're gonna be different looking from this first set of leaves. They're very, these are just very generic looking. And then the second set of leaves will come up. So um, it's gonna take a little time for the peppers and the eggplants to get going. But once they do, you'll see the difference in the leaf shape. They generally look very different from each other and especially from the tomato. Once you get to that point in June when you're gonna plant them, uh, I would say June 1st. Let's just go with June 1st. Unless your peppers and your eggplants are really tiny still, give them another couple of weeks. It's no rush. You're gonna get, you're gonna get something off of it. Give it the right start. Don't, don't rush things. Um, you're gonna plant your tomatoes three feet apart. Yes, three feet apart. I said that. And I'm gonna say it again, three feet apart. And the reason why I say this is the plants are gonna need the energy from the soil that it can pick up, the nutrients that it pulls from the soil. It's also gonna need the space. I mean, you're gonna put that plant in the ground, you're gonna say, oh my gosh, that's three feet for what? For that? That's ridiculous. But the truth is the plant's gonna grow very large. I mean, we've all seen this happen with weeds. You're like, oh, those are tiny. They're not, nothing's gonna happen. And then you're like, oh my gosh, you have a jungle. Anyway, so three feet apart for airflow, for the ability of the soil to feed that plant, that's called carrying capacity. The plant can only get so much from so much square feet. And if you have another plant crammed up right next to it, if they're gonna compete and then you're not gonna get a great crop. So more is not better in this case, more space is better, but not more plants. So three feet, if you can get a structure on there to, to tie it up, that would be your best bet. That will increase airflow, reduce any kind, of, um, any kind of diseases that might develop from moisture that's not drying off those leaves. When you water, you're gonna water in the morning. Early mornings best, give the plant the whole day to dry off. If it's raining, clearly you're not watering anything. Nature's gonna just take its course. Finally, uh, the peppers, you're gonna plant about a foot apart. Foot to 18 inches apart is perfectly fine for peppers. They don't need a lot of space. You may wanna think about throwing a tomato cage around them because they may get heavy with fruit and those branches tend to break. And then finally, the, um, the eggplant, I would say 18 inches apart. Now, 18 inches is really where I put them. I wouldn't make them further apart because eggplants happen to like to be crowded up next to each other for some reason. I don't know, maybe they feed each other somehow, they share nutrients, I don't know. But if you ever grew one eggplant in a pot or uh, grew one eggplant in the ground and it, it's sad, that's your reason. I couldn't grow eggplant for a very long time. And finally, I'm growing eggplant because I'm giving it the spacing it needs. So 18 inches apart for the eggplant. And I'm thinking, do I have everything covered? I think I do. And Regina, we do have a question. Sure. Uh, Kathy said that she planted seeds in eggshells. Will the roots grow through the shells or does she have to break the shells? Um, she grew roots, she grew tomatoes in eggshells. Oh, that's, what, what kind of plant was it? By chance. Well, here's the thing. I think that's a great way to add a lot of calcium to the soil. Um, I've never done it. So I don't really know the mechanism by which the roots will shoot through that. It, they should decompose. It may not be a bad thing just to, but she puts that soil in there too. It may not be a bad idea just to crack it a little so that it does disintegrate once it gets in soil. I, I imagine this, the planting process is gonna crack that shell. Yeah, she did tomatoes and peppers. I know I've been seeing that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen the promotion of, you know, putting them in the eggshells. And I was apprehensive because of that same thought. Like if they don't degrade, you know, if it doesn't, you know, quick enough, then will your roots kind of get stuck there? So I have a feeling just the process of planting that is going to do enough damage to that eggshell. Yeah. Eggshells are notoriously fragile, right? Right. So, and, you know, if you're not sure, just, I would just, give it a little crack. It's going to, yeah, I think I would do that as well. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. 
Hopefully it works well. Give us some feedback on how yeah. that worked I'd out. I'd love to hear. Happy. I'd love to hear. Okay, there's a question from Linda. You see it pop up here. Oh, great. Um, uh, last year, vines, runners from some plants took over the other plants. What's the best type of trellis wall use? How, how big or small the grid spaces? Okay, so of course it depends on what kind of plant we're talking about. So let's just let's just let's just say cucumbers, right? If it's a cucumber plant. Um, really cucumbers are, are great. They love to scramble along the ground, but they're great for growing vertically. And I would highly recommend growing those vertically always. It's easier to find the fruit, which means you're gonna be able to pick it, which means the plant isn't gonna to get to maturity and decide to stop producing. Um, it really depends on the plant. I mean, if you have to reach through something, which I can't imagine you would, I don't think it matters what size grid it is. I use this stuff called um, Fort Nova. It's a, it's a plastic, um, it's a plastic trellising that's got UV light protection. I wish I could, if I had it in my hands right now, I'd show you. It's got a grid about this big. So I'd say four by four. It's great. It stretches over a couple of posts. I usually use, just use bamboo. I usually use small stakes that go into the ground and then I tie bamboo stakes to it because it's a really easy, simple, inexpensive way Regina, to, would you mind just typing into the sure. chat the name of that? Yeah, let me um, get my, let me just make sure I'm giving you the right name. So let me get my iPad and look it up fast. Um, you can just even just put a couple of posts up and tie some twine across it and just help those plants up initially. And that will get them going. Once they start, once they start twining around that, you're not going to have any issues. They send up tendrils. So again, that's the, that's the other issue. It's what kind of plants. So if we're talking about zucchini, people do grow those things vertically, but you may have to give it a little more of a boost. You might have to, um, you know, tie them up as they go. People grow peppers vertically. People grow tomatoes vertically. And there are many methods for that. And I, I mean, I have a whole class on that. Um, but I like to use a couple of stakes and I like to do this thing where I weave my, my, my twine or my jute or whatever it is that I'm using through the plants. And it's almost like a, a weave. It's called a Florida weave. Let me just look up this thing before I forget. Um, and that works great for tomatoes. Great. I mean, better than cages, better than steaks. It's just my own uh, preference. Everyone has different preferences. And, there, and that's the other thing. There are many ways to do Port Nova netting. There are many ways to do gardening. Don't let anybody tell you doing it wrong. If you're getting good results, that's all that matters. Yeah, it's called Fortinova netting. Okay, I'm gonna type it in here. Fortinova, if I could just type Nova netting. Um, that's what I use for my cucumbers. And what's nice about it is it's really sturdy. It's not like that other, kind of cheesy stuff where you go to pull it and it rips, it never rips. I mean, you could just like yeah. yank on it and that never breaks. It's really terrific. I'm actually trying to use it to keep cats out of my garden right now. It's not really working. I've got a cat I want to go to shoot, but, and I love cats. Um, that I could, you do, um, don't plan viney things. Cause like I said before, you're looking at that little plant and you're saying, ah, oh, this is plenty of space. Just put them in a couple of cells, let them run where they need to run. And, you know, they're going to run towards the sun. So when you're planting your plants, if you're planting a cucumber, not a cucumber, but like a squash, there are, there are bush, bush varieties of squash that will just make a plant like this and it won't run. There are things that will run like crazy, like uh, pumpkins. Plant it at the north end of your bed and let it run to the south because it's going to head towards the sun. And you can always pick those vines up and keep directing them someplace else. But you, if you can avoid it at all, I would keep the vining things away from the things that are not vining because they do take over and you don't think they're going to, but they always do. Okay, so um, anything else or? You're, you're okay. Does anyone else have any questions? I guess we'll give everyone just a moment to sure. put any questions they have. 
Uh, Linda said it was fantastic. Thank you, Linda. Um, yeah, you really pack a lot of information in. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Try to think if there's anything else I need to tell you, but I don't think so. Key things, time, intention, attention. That's the key to success. Yeah. In almost every, we all everything. Have Hopefully we all have delicious tomatoes, jalapenos, and eggplants this year. Yes, I'm sure you so, will. Absolutely sure you will. So hopefully. Um, again, this is recorded. So if you have to go back and listen to something, this will be up on our YouTube channel for two weeks. So you can certainly use it as a resource. If you have any questions, all of you got an email from me this morning. So I can certainly um, answer them for you. And Regina is always very generous with her time. So if it's something that I cannot answer, I will forward it on to Regina and I'm sure she'll be happy to answer it. Absolutely. Um, she'll be back with us in June, as she mentioned before. And uh, we're also looking at a few programs for September and October. So lots of chances to connect with Regina in the future. And always remember that we have lots of resources here at the library, a large collection of gardening books and resources for you so you can take advantage of those as well. Right, and of course, if you're a C, if you're a Middle Country Public Library card holder, you have a terrific seed library there. And uh, Amber has, she's she's really done a fantastic job in terms of what she's got available to you. And there are many things that you can plant right into the ground that you don't need to transplant. And I know she's got lots of seeds of those types. Absolutely. And the seed library is open um, whenever the library is open. So you can stop in our center reach building and take a look at what we have. Also on our um, seed library's webpage, everything is listed, what is available, what we're out of. So you can just head over to that um, page and check it out. So we're just about 11.15. Oh, one more question. All right. got it in just in the nick of time. Um, go ahead, Linda. Linda, I can also unmute you if you want. Oh, wait, okay. Uh, do you thin the seedlings? Okay, well, um, in this case, like we talked about, since you're putting two in there, you maybe have to be a hard-hearted human being and snip one off. But if you got two up and you wanted to try to separate them out, you could do that carefully. Uh, just know that you're going to be disturbing the roots and that you'll need to uh, really baby those things along. Um, so yes, if you have more than one emerge, you're going to have to thin them. But, you know, if you feel like you want to just take a risk and just put one in each, you've got plenty of these, these peat pots. I mean, you got four of them. You can just do four seeds of your jalapeno, um, your eggplant and your pepper. I mean, uh, tomato, and you could save the rest of the tomato seeds for next year or give them to some friends to start or buy some more peat pellets. And they're very inexpensive. They're very inexpensive. Um, or you could just put two in there like I did. I would personally, I pre-germinate everything. So I, I, that's exactly why I don't like to have to take the risk. I always just want one pot, one seedling in each pot. But, and you could certainly do that today, but you know, I would just, get it going and get them started somehow. Uh, I wouldn't thin them when they're ready to emerge. I would let them get a little more mature. So I would say at least you're gonna have two, um, at least two sets of true leaves on there. So you'll have that cob lead in leaf, which is teeny tiny beginning, and then two more sets of leaves. So one set will come up and then the next set will come up. And I would say at that point, maybe transplant them and then you could transplant them into something else you wouldn't want to try to cram them back into one of these things these these peak pellets um and then you might be able to pull them apart and then put them into something else and then that would go right into the ground at some point you would unpot it from that particular container and put it right into the ground yeah I'm a terrible farmer I can't thin things I mean you got to thin things and if you're growing things like carrots you have to thin them uh, the plant, like I said before, if you're directly sowing and it calls for thinning, don't think you're going to get away with it by not thinning. Uh, you're not going to be able to get a 
production of a fruit because, or, or, you know, root, um, because the plant can, will take up the nutrients and there's only so much, so many nutrients the soil can offer. And even if you give it uh, nutrition like kelp or, or worm casting or compost, even better, um, you're going to always have, um, that competition. It's just, and the plant itself will exude something from the roots to keep other things from growing because it wants to survive. It wants to get its seed into the into the future. If you don't thin, will they suffer or they get they get bigger? Yeah, they won't they won't grow to maturity because they're not getting the nutrition they need. Number one, um, and they'll get crowded and there'll be poor air circulation and just it's just you have to thin. I mean, look, in nature, sometimes things drop to the ground and they seem to do just fine. Certainly, if you want to just take an, do an experiment and plant the thing in with the, both plants, I don't know what will happen. They've been growing up together since the beginning. Maybe it'll be like Siamese twins or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. But yeah, you need to give things space because the, the soil can only give it so much um, nutrition and water and access to water and all of those things. So follow the directions, yeah. Okay, I'm glad I answered your questions. This has been so much fun. Yeah, thank you so much, oh, Regina. So you have a fantastic day. You Hope too. Hope everyone enjoys the sun that just came out and your garden will enjoy the rain tomorrow. Sounds so thanks great. everybody. Yeah. Uh,